All right, this video is about rate of change. Now this uh, question is sort of inside out because instead of uh, giving you an interval and asking you to find the rate of change, I'm giving you the rate of change and uh, one side of the interval, the beginning number of an interval. And I'm asking you what would the other end point of the interval have to be in order to achieve this rate of change. And I'm giving you the function. Shout out to Shane Coffin, who requested that I do this problem. Thanks a lot, Shane. Now bear with me. I have not worked this problem out ahead of time, so I'm just going to figure this out as I go. So it might get a little bumpy. What we know about rate of change, or especially average rate of change, is this is just another way of saying slope. All right, so every time I see average rate of change, I'm thinking slope. Now when it comes to slope, I know the formula for slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So they're telling us that the rate of change is going to equal negative 1 over 10. Okay, the rate of change is negative 1 over 10. That means the slope is going to equal negative 1 over 10. Now, another thing you need to know is that uh, when we're talking about an interval, the, an interval is always x values. All right, when they're giving you an interval for a function, they're talking about as we look across the x axis. So that means these are x values. So you can think of this as x1, and you can think of this as x2. But both of these are x values. So if I substitute 2 and b uh, into my formula, OK, so I've got b minus 2, all right, x2 minus x1. All right, so this is what I have so far. So um, I'm going to need these y values. If we're going to solve for b, we need to have only one variable. So I'm going to need um, some numbers, or at least expressions that have b in them, to represent these y values. So let's think about that. Um, sometimes I like to set things up in terms of a chart, like an x, y, chart. So remember, I've got these two x values. All right, I've got the number 2 and I've got b. And I, I want to know the y values that go with them. But I've got this function. And uh, you know, we can think of it as y equals 1 over x. OK, maybe I'll just put it here. All right, so these y values equal 1 over x. Well, that means this y value, if x is 2, then this is going to be 1 over 2. Um, guess what this y value is going to be? You guessed it. This is going to be 1 over b. OK, so this is y2, and this is y1. OK, just like this was b x2, and this is x1. So let's substitute these values into the formula. OK, again, we're going to think of this as y1 and this as y2. This was x1. This was x2. So if I put these into my formula, and I'll just erase this and put them in, all right, y2 minus y1 becomes 1 over b minus 1 half. So now I've got an equation that has one variable, just b. If I can solve this equation for b, then I am golden. All right, I paused the video for a second, and I was running through a couple possible strategies to solve this equation. Um, but the one I decided to try is cross multiplying. You know, I see that I have a fraction inside of this fraction, so eventually I'll have to deal with that.
but I think it will take care of one of the fractions, if you will, if we go ahead and cross multiply. So um, I'm hoping that you know what cross multiplying is in general. Okay, otherwise this won't make a lot of sense, but I can make a new equation by multiplying this diagonal and setting it equal to this diagonal. I'm going to multiply these. Okay, so let's see. If I do the green diagonal, 10 times, you know, maybe I'll just set it up. So I have 10 times 1 over b minus 1 half, all right? That's the green diagonal, this times this, equals. Now I'm going to do the purple diagonal. So that's going to be negative 1 times b minus 2. So I no longer have a fraction inside of a fraction. Now I just have regular fractions. So I feel like we're getting closer to a solution. So um, if I had multiply these fractions by 10, you know, keeping in mind, I suppose, that this is 10 over 1. So as I distribute this 10, um, hopefully you'll understand that I'm going to wind up multiplying by 10 here and here. The 10 is just going to the numerators because this is like 10 over 1. I'm multiplying the numerators by 10. And if you have to think of it this way, we're multiplying the denominators by 1. So the denominators aren't going to change. Okay, so after I distribute this 10 throughout, then I'm going to wind up with 10 over b minus 10 over 2. I'm going to distribute this negative 1 as well. So that's going to give me negative b plus 2. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. So I took that 10 and distributed it, and it wound up here and here. So there you go. All right, so we're getting a lot closer to what we need to have. Um, let's go ahead and deal with this. 10 divided by 2 is 5. So that gives me 10 over b minus 5 is equal to negative b plus 2. So I'm going to get the b's together. I think that's going to help me. And uh, I will get the constants together. So if I add b to both sides, you know, plus b plus b, so that gives me 10 over b plus b minus 5 is equal to 2. And now I'm going to add 5 to both sides. So I'm going to have 10 over b plus b is equal to 7. Now there's a couple different ways I could go with this. I could try to make like denominators here by doing um, b over b. So I'd have b squared and I could put these together and have 10 plus b squared over b. That's one way to go. Um, I don't think I'm going to do it that way. When I have a fraction, uh, just a simple fraction, uh, a lot of times I like to multiply by the denominator. If I do that now, I would multiply both sides of the equation by b. I'm targeting the denominator. So let's do that. So say if I multiply everything by b. That would be a legal algebraic move, multiplying both sides of the equation by b. But that would have the benefit of canceling this b out. So finally, I have no fractions. So that's sort of been my first goal, is to get rid of those fractions. So now I have 10 plus b squared is equal to 7b. Now I see I've got this quadratic forming, this quadratic equation. It's b squared. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to try to either factor this or use the quadratic formula. Either way, it's looking like I'm going to need 0 on one side. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in standard form. So first of all, uh, I could switch these around. You know, addition is commutative. So I could write this as b squared plus 10 uh, is equal to 7b. And now I will subtract 7b from both sides. 
So minus 7b minus 7b. All right, this is not like terms with either one of these things, so I'm going to wind up putting it in the middle. So I'm going to have b squared minus 7b plus 10 is equal to 0. Um, now, hopefully this is factorable. So I'm going to try to factor it. Okay, so b squared would factor as b times b. All right, 10. When I'm looking at 10, I'm thinking uh, this is either going to be 2 times 5 or 1 times 10. So if I go with 2 times 5, I know that inner plus outer has to equal the middle. All right, this is what I always think when I'm factoring. Inner plus outer equals middle. All right, the middle is this uh, negative 7b. So inner, I have 2b. Outer, I have 5b. I need it to make negative 7b. It will make negative 7 if both of these are negative. Negative 2b, negative 5b, that makes negative 7b. So that means this would need to be negative and that would be ne need to be negative. Also, negative 2 times negative 5 does make positive 10. So this is the correct factorization. So we factored it. So of course, um, if you have two factors multiplied together equaling 0, you will, can get your solutions by setting each of these equal to 0. So either b minus 2 equals 0 or b minus 5 will equal 0. So b will either equal 2 or b is going to equal 5. Alright, those are the two solutions to this equation. Now, I'm thinking one of these is not going to make sense in the context of this problem. Okay, so remember we got the solutions 2 and 5. So b is could either equal 2 or 5 to solve the equation that we came up with. But would it make sense um, the interval from 2 to 2? Okay, if this interval started, at, um, I'm analyzing this option. If we started at 2 and ended at 2, um, then there wouldn't be any change between there. So it wouldn't make sense for, the, uh, for that to be uh, an average rate of change of negative 1 over 10. So it can't be 2. So that's, we, we call that extraneous, all right, because that one doesn't make sense. So the answer must be 5. The answer must be 5. Um, but let's check it. Okay, if the answer is 5, let's substitute that in and see what the average rate of change is. If we are right, it will give us negative 1 over 10. Okay, so if b is 5, then now we have this answer. It's weird. That we're going from 2 to 5. Okay, so now we'll get the y value. So this would be 1 over 2, because y equals 1 over x. And this would be 1 over 5 at this point. So the average rate of change from 2 to 5, we would calculate it using the slope formula. y minus y over x minus x. So let's do that and see what we get. So the rate of change would equal um, y minus y, so 1 fifth minus 1 half over x minus x, 5 minus 2. Now, I could do this by hand oh, over the course of a few minutes, um, but I'm going to use my calculator because at this level, I think we're allowed to use calculators. All right? I'm betting that Shane is not in middle school. Okay, and thus calculators are okay. Okay, so I'm going to use my TI-30 XS multi view.
to do this calculation. So here we go, fraction mode. Um, and I, you know what, I guess I need another fraction up there. So I'm going to do 1 fifth minus 1 half over 5 minus 2. Moment of truth, drum roll. Brrr, Negative 1 over 10. So that's the rate of change that we were in fact shooting for. So the correct answer is in fact 5. Thanks Shane. I had a lot of fun doing that problem. I hope it was helpful.